welcome to Gen Visibility interview series. We bring visibility to our genesis, geniuses, genealogy, generosity, and gentleness. You may feel isolated or alone, but you are not. We are a vibrant, thriving, creative, and amazing community. We are adventurers, trendsetters, and trailblazers. If you want to be part of Gen Visibility, please submit our form by visiting our website, genvisibility.com. Your voice matters, your story matters, and we cannot wait to see you shine. Hi, Jenna. Hi, how are you? <laughs> Great. Uh, I'm so glad uh, to be speaking with you today. And yeah. I'm just really curious to hear more about you. I was wondering if you could share a bit about um, your current career, what you've been putting your energy into. Yeah, so I actually um, am in the middle of a little bit of a job transition. I just uh, got a new job working with a nonprofit program that works with LGBTQ youth in the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, and my role there will be uh, doing education and training for local community organizations, companies, schools, um, basically, basically working with them to see how they can best help uh, and support their LGBTQ members or youth in their communities and those types of things. Um, also in that role, I'll be facilitating some social groups uh, with LGBTQ youth, trying to, again, support them in their experiences. So I'm going to start that in a few weeks from when we are talking. Um, and yeah, so I'm very excited for that new new position. What part of the position feels most exciting? Do you like working with youth or the organizing part? Uh, I, mean, I like all of it, which is a kind of a cop-out answer. I think the most rewarding part uh, is going to be working with the youth directly, um, doing some of those social groups and, and hearing some of those experiences that people are having in their day-to-day -day life and seeing how I can best support them. Um, I think it'll also be cool to see what different organizations and companies are trying to do to be more inclusive or what they're looking from me to help them to do, uh, to support LGBTQ people in their communities. Great. And you say you're in the San Francisco area right now? Yeah, I'm in the San Francisco Bay Area currently. Yeah. Okay. And you are a writer as well? I mean, I think, right, your last gig was uh, as a journalist? Uh, yeah, so I've sort of dabbled in, in a bunch of different things. Um, before this, I was in graduate school before the uh, COVID pandemic sort of uh, put put the brakes on uh, or made it more difficult, at least for job hunting and that sort of thing. Um, so while I was in graduate school, I worked part time doing a few different things, including working as a uh, sports reporter for an ultimate Frisbee sports media organization. Um, I've written some for them, and then I've also done some sort of freelance-esque writing, um, talking about my own experiences and story and sort of how they all relate to different things that are going on in my community. Cool. And what, what was your post-grad for? Uh, so I have a master's degree in communication studies um, with a focus on gender and sports um, and those types of things. So it was it was a general master's degree name, but it was very much focused on gender, LGBTQ, uh, and, and sports. sports issues. Yeah, that's great. Really interesting stuff. Yeah. And um, how old are you? Uh, I <laughs> just turned 27 yesterday. Oh, wow. Happy <laughs> birthday. Thank you. Yeah. That's great. 27. Yeah. Great. Um, and tell me a bit more about, uh, well, was graduate school in, in the Bay Area or did you just move there? So I did graduate school up in Reno, Nevada, uh, okay. about three hours northeast of the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, the Bay Area is where my parents live. And so I've been uh, staying with them through the pandemic and, and a bit before then. So, um, yeah, San Francisco Bay Area has been home, at least in one respect or another for a while, um, as I also did my undergraduate degree at UC Berkeley. Uh, so I went to Berkeley and then went up the hill to Reno and then came back to live with my parents for the last year or so. 
we're gonna we're gonna hear more about uh your uh your coming out and your transition later but um how old were you when you came out i was i was 22 23 when i came out i started transitioning when i was 22 um, came out publicly when I was 23 at the beginning of 2017. So was that in Reno at that point? Yeah, that was in Reno. Yeah. Reno, sorry. Um, <laughs> yeah, that was, in, that was in Reno. Um, basically, the whole time I was there, that story, I know, so we'll get to it later. But basically, um, two weeks before I moved to Reno, I realized I was trans. I, I sort of put all the pieces together finally. Um, so I was moving to a new place with all new people, starting a new program and a new me, as it turned out. Um, and so then I was talking to a therapist up there. Then I started hormones at a clinic in Reno. Um, and yeah, just slowly came out over the course of graduate school. Um, so yeah. since we started, <laughs> let's just get right into it. And then we can go back to to talking about your your current life. But um, so you know i a lot of children or family of children that are uh, that are transitioning socially transitioning if they're younger um will use an opportunity like that like you know it's summertime and you're not in school or you're entering a new school to just you know present as their gender their proper gender and you know choose a new name if need be um and and offer like that kind of an easier cleaner transition did that cross your mind that you would just arrive in in reno and just you know introduce yourself as a woman or so so not, not quite you weren't quite ready it was not the plan <laughs> no okay <laughs> that was the, the, that was never the plan um it was very much a surprise to me initially when i first like had the full realization like it wasn't that there weren't signs and indications before that didn't very much become clear as I was like, oh, this is actually a thing. Um, but it wasn't something that I was planning by any means. Um, right. And what ended up happening is that about my first six months in Reno, um, I presented as a man, um, as a guy publicly because I had just moved and I didn't want to rock the boat too much in terms of I wanted to get my feet right. settled and then go from there. Um, I also, in my own personal uh, transition, I wanted to start my medical transition. I wanted to start hormones for a while before I came out publicly. Right. Um, and so I did that. And then I did take a break to sort of move a little bit further forward. I took the winter break between my fall and spring semesters to like go clothes shopping, to actually fill out my wardrobe a little bit and do those sorts of things um, to then set me up so that when I came back to school in the spring, then I presented as Jenna. So people definitely knew me as both when I was there, at least initially. Um, so yeah, it wasn't planned, but I also did use that break to sort of have more of a way to make it a little bit cleaner when I came back in the spring. You know, I'm realizing as I'm talking to you that I have all these questions that are coming up to my mind and they're coming up because I'm a cis woman and, um, you know, the, the idea of, uh, this level of a revelation about yourself to be, I mean, I've, I've surprised myself in my life, but like, I mean, they weren't really exciting surprises, right? I'm just like, oh, I didn't expect myself to do this today. You know, like that's that's a departure. But like to have that level of a surprise seems so hard to wrap my mind around, right? And I want to ask you about this, but I'm also thinking, Do I'm also wondering, do you think that this is interesting to a trans and non-binary audience? Like if you were in your transition already or you were pre-transition or post-transition do you think this would be interesting to hear from someone or you're like oh no this is just education of <laughs> cisgender people which is also valuable yeah. and, and the podcast will be listened to by both <laughs> you know hopefully trans people and their family but right. still i'm wondering what do you think so my realization was more of a, I would more categorize it as a stopping of denial 
if that makes sense. Um, (laughs) Because there have been signs of indications like in how I was thinking about my gender and and the world and and how I fit in it for about a decade before I realized I was trans. Um, Mm -hmm. There was a moment when I was about 12 um, when I like wanted to try my mom's clothes on because I wanted to feel like what it was like to be a girl, which is not something that most cis 12 year old boys do. Um, but then I ended up being embarrassed and ashamed of that experience, um, because I was caught by my parents, um, Mm -hmm. doing that. And so then I buried it for 10 years. (laughs) Um, and so for me, what, what sparked the coming, what sparked the realization was someone else sharing their story Um, about their experiences, about being a boy, wanting to be a girl in a few different ways, um, that was like, oh, that's my experience. Maybe I also fit into this category of trans woman. Right. Um, And so me sharing- It's not all that one one story. Like if you you knew at four that you were trans, then you are trans, right? It's like that the one kind of cliche- That's the classic story, but that was not the case- for me, I mean, and right. I don't even remember before 12, if there were instances or, or ways that I maybe seemed or acted differently um, than my cisgender peers growing up. Um, most of my friends were girls in like elementary school. So maybe that was a sign, but like, right. who knows? It depends on the people at times. Sometimes right, cis boys have right. lots right. of girlfriends um, yeah. growing up. So yeah, it's not the classic narrative. And I think that's okay because right. everyone has different experiences in different ways. Um, but it sounds and, like and, once yeah. you, sorry, it sounds like <laughs> once you knew though, once you were like facing the denial, you were just like, holy shit. Yes, this is it. <laughs> and, and I'm going to need not to curse on this podcast. I need to, I need to re-say that. Once yeah. you realize it, you're like, wow, like I'm, this is this is so clear, right? It sounds like it was yeah. a pretty a pretty at that point it just kind of happened fast. Yeah, it, it very knew. much. Once I sort of realized, I was like, "Oh yeah, this is a thing that feels like." Once I I th- thought the words to myself, like maybe I'm a trans woman, like something inside me rang so true with that right. that it was, it like, was oh. just. I just a once release. I sort of thought that it was like. I, I, there's no going back from this. That that was true. That was a thing that is true for me. Um, and so then that was, again, two weeks before I moved to Reno. And so I sometimes joke that I spent the first few months uh, in Reno, my first summer in Reno, working two jobs. One as a graduate student doing research, six to eight hours a day, and another six to eight hours a day reading and researching and thinking about trans stuff. Wow. Uh, because I was just trying to process it myself because I didn't know anyone in Reno, not really. Um, I was living with one roommate who I didn't know, who I was just assigned to as a as a graduate student in graduate student housing. Uh, so he wasn't very helpful. Um, so it was really just sort of me in my room a lot of times, just on the computer and just sort of like processing what was going on and like weekly therapy sessions. Um and then my and your other therapist was helpful. Like they, yeah, they got theory. it. Okay. They were good. It was a, I, a good so experience. What's cool about Reno. And you wouldn't think about, think this about Reno, Nevada, which is sort of right. classically considered like a small town, kind right. of conservative, kind of rural, but they're really good about trans folks. Um, there's a clinic in Reno called Northern Nevada hopes um, that when, uh, I was there, and it still is uh, a provider of healthcare for marginalized people in Reno, um, which includes the transgender population. Um, and so that's an informed consent clinic. So when I decided I wanted to start hormones, I went in, got some paperwork that says, here's what hormones are going to do to you. I signed the paper saying, yes, I'm good. They did some lab work that all came back clean. And within two weeks, I had hormones. Um Wow. which is basically just the time that took the lab work to be processed. Uh-huh. Um, and part of Northern Nevada Hopes and some other organizations in Reno, um, they actually had a transgender resource guide um, that was available online. So even before I moved to Reno in like the two weeks before I moved, I like found the resource guide, which included a list of therapists. 
And so I called a couple of them um, who were listed as good for trans folks in right. Reno. That's great. And got connected with Warren. And she remained my therapist through the whole time I was in Reno. And did you, like, how long did it take you to find, you know, a community of people to be yourself with when you were in Reno? Um, so I would say the answer is not very long and also a long time. Um, because one of those communities I would say that I felt very comfortable in was the ultimate Frisbee community, which sort of gets into our sports aspect, um, and, and how that all ended up playing out for me. Um, so the ultimate Frisbee community, um, I did actual therapy once a week for when I first got to Reno. And I also went and played ultimate once a week, which was sort of a different sort of therapy because it allowed me to get out of my head. It allowed me to, um, just play. And, and have fun and not think about my gender for, you know, a couple hours each week when I was in the midst of this, like, big inner turmoil trying to figure it out. Um, and the Ultimate Frisbee community was very welcoming to me. They were um, some of, if not the first people that I came out to in Reno um, were some of my Ultimate Frisbee team. Um, and that was a co team or uh, a so team? it's ultimate is a little bit complicated in that there was a local summer league that went on um just during the summer it's community members um and that was mixed gender so men and women playing together um and then also the college teams because i still had college eligibility as a graduate student um were men and women men's and women's teams so my first semester i actually played with the men's team in college because that's how i was presenting and identifying and then the spring semester, I, I moved over to practicing with the women's team. And that happened, like the, the men team, men's team was supportive, the women's, like what, what was yeah. that transition like? Yeah. Basically all, all pretty much supportive. Um, like that, that was just sort of a thing that was happening and, and people were generally okay with it. Um, I, so I was coming out to some folks, this was October, 2016 or so, actually about four years ago now um, when I was starting to come out to some of the ultimate Frisbee community, just like one or two people at a time. Um, but then the men's team was making cuts between their A team and their B team. Um, and I, because I wasn't sure of how my transition would go, wanted to be on the B team when I could have been on the A team. Mm -hmm. And so I talked to the head coach and was like, Hey, I'm transitioning. This is a thing. Can you put me on the B team? instead of the A team, because I might move to the women's team in like a month. Yeah. And <laughs> <laughs> what was I, his reaction? He was, he was totally fine. He was like, I totally understand that. Wow. He, he was a grad, he was a PhD student in, in English. Like oh, okay. he was totally chill about it. Right. He was like, yeah, I totally understand. We can definitely do that. Cool. Um, and it'll be fine. But what ended up happening is because people expected me to be on the A team and not the B team. Then and they were like, like Hey, yeah. exactly. <laughs> And then I was it? like, well, here's the situation. I, I um, kind of pushed you a little bit, forced your hand bit, to yeah. share to share which a bit is, sooner, which is good. Which right? is fine. Like it was going to yeah. happen eventually. And that was just yeah. sort of one of those catalysts that like made it happen. Um, right. And then it was, again, just sort of a process with the women's team being like, hey, this is a thing. And <laughs> there was like one moment where I was added to the social groups, like the Facebook group and the group me chat. Um, and I was eating food with some of both of the men's and women's teams one time. Um, and one of the freshman girls walks up and is like, hey, to me, hey, why are you in all our groups now? <laughs> and I was like, well, it's because I'm going to be on the team next semester. And she was like, what? what? Like, why? <laughs> and I was like, because I'm transgender. And like half the table knew and uh -huh. half the table didn't know. <laughs> uh -huh. And everyone was sort of like, cool we kind of figured <laughs> that but like we're we're gonna roll with it that's um, great and there was only like one guy who sort of made some crass comments because he's a college boy he was kind of being dumb right. mm -hmm. but then he got crap he he got made fun of by other people on the men's team for saying dumb comments that's who, great so people backed me up wow with this so guy that was, who was a pretty thinking, amazing environment <laughs> for transitioning was, like a good like, school yeah. right that's good school, really... good community, good yeah. good players. Um, and, and did then, you find a community also of trans? Was was that actually yeah, so important I was to get you? To the, oh, okay, go ahead. Sorry. Second part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> so 
that was the the ultimate frisbee was the yes it, I, I found that community relatively quickly um the trans community took a little bit longer um because there as usual aren't that many trans folks and if you're not actively involved in the community it can be tricky to find um but my therapist um had started uh i think it was also just in the fall um ended up starting a group therapy with trans femme people mm. um, and so i started to get to know folks through the group therapy mm-hmm. um, and then also as i got more involved in the community as sort of an activist advocate writer speaker whatever then i got much more involved in in working with and talking with different members of the trans community in reno um so that took a little bit longer mm -hmm, but it did eventually happen and was it really important for you to at least initially to meet other trans women or you wanted to meet just folks in the trans and non-binary non-binary community period was it important so I think for me, um, knowing trans women was particularly important because while all trans people have some similar experiences, um, each sort of direction or set of type of identity thing like has some more similarities, especially right. trans women versus trans men specifically. Mm-hmm. Um, because when I was in college at UC Berkeley, um, I was in the marching band and there were actually two trans folks Um, who transitioned during the time I was in the marching band, Um, but both were trans men. And I sometimes wonder if it would have been different if there was another trans woman transitioning in the band at the same time I was there. No, and that the, that that those transition didn't click for you. It didn't do anything. Because it was no. different. It was it, it was, was just a different a, yeah. thing. Yeah, yeah. I, it was that I makes was sense cool to me. with them. I was fine with them, yeah. but it was a different thing. It was a different way right. of sort of thinking about their experiences right. that didn't connect in the same way to mine right. um so for me talking with other trans women it's it's much more of a feeling of like yeah we're like thinking about the same issues we're like dealing with the same sort of problems and concerns um that other folks um that aren't <clears throat> trans femme maybe don't have to deal with um in quite the same way um Yeah. So so it was important for me to really get to know other trans femme people because we could actually share more about similar experiences. Are most of the people that uh, in in Reno, at least, that you have met through uh, your activism and and, uh, just speaking out and, and, and reaching out to the trans community, have they mostly been trans women who transition after puberty or did you also meet people who medically transitioned early in their life and were passing fully and still not, wanted to mm-hmm. yeah not that i know of um i it was mostly folks who were transitioning um as a second puberty right yeah um like that second puberty that's a good one <laughs> as if one I mean, is that's not enough is. right <laughs> <laughs> really um yeah no i didn't really know any trans youth when i was in reno they definitely existed um but those weren't the circles that i tended to run in um like i was much more involved with like um the university community Mm -hmm. so that was more college students who were transitioning um or like the group therapies that I was a part of tend to be people about my age. Because again, you want to share similar experiences right. have people in similar stages of life. Right. And so the groups I ended up finding and, and associating with tend to be people around my age yeah. um, and, and having similar experiences to me. Right, right. I, you know, it's just a, a kind of something that um, I hope I learn more about and explore more. I'm, I'm very curious about how you know, an earlier transition and, you know, the whole concept of passing, the ability to pass, you know, basically having had the experience uh, from the very beginning, uh, if you've had hormone blockers and you're uh, having a first puberty that's in your gender, um, how that leads to seeking and needing a community of transgender people or, um, Yeah, I don't know if you have any any thoughts about that. I think that if <clears throat> someone were to transition earlier, um, younger, I think the experience 
is actually pretty different um, because there's a lot when you grow up that is kind of terrible when you're trans and when you have to deal with the, the after effects if you're transitioning later. Um, and so having some sort of community and, and like they're obviously part of the trans community, but it's just a, I think a radically different experience. Mm -hmm. Um, and I sometimes wonder for myself, like, what would it be like if at age 12, like when I was, I had that first experience of like, what if I was in a situation where parents were like, cool, let's get to a therapist. Let's figure this out. If this is a thing you want to explore, like, let's do it. Like, I, I seriously wonder what would happen. Like, I don't know if I would be on the same track that I was. Um, I don't know if I would be remotely as public as I am. Um, right. If I had transitioned earlier, I might have been like, hey, I'm going to transition. I'm going to do this thing. And then I'm just going to live my life. Right. Um, right. It's and a not worry about part it. of it's, me versus. Um, versus what it became for me, which was like. Front and center. The whole thing, my whole life, basically. Right. right. Which is exhausting because on the one hand, Andy. <laughs> right. it's, 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 uh, uh, I mean, your identity is, uh, you know, especially when you belong to, uh, a marginalized group is, is, is very meaningful, can be very important, but, um, but it's still just one part of you. And so yeah. to end up having so much attention giving to this one part of you can be, uh, quite frustrating, I imagine. Yeah. And I can see why people would choose to not to uh focus on that you know if they are yeah. passing um i mean and, and like, the, right. i am i am also i think generally passing if i was just right. out on the street walking around which is not something i do very often anymore but like right. <laughs> <laughs> when I know, yeah. you know back back before the pandemic or after the pandemic i think if i'm out on the street like i am taller like five eight five nine right. but i generally have all the features that you would associate with a cis woman right. and so right you look like you an think, athlete yeah i'm an athletic right. cis. i look like an athletic cis woman exactly, and like unless yeah. you talk to me for an extended period right. of time or unless we have an extended interaction you may not pick up on yeah. that but um, because of your later transition it's become important for you to kind of participate in that you well, know in the activism at least for now yes yes and no i would huh. say like it, it's important for me personally right. um and I don't think everyone who transitions later wants to do this or, or, right. or feels a need to do it. Um, and so part of the motivation for me to be active, to speak up, to give a TEDx talk in front of 2,000 people is because then hopefully I can help other people not have to do that work. Right. I can, I can make it so that other people can just live their lives as mm -hmm. they want without having to educate every single person every single group that they come across like right. part of the work and what i'm really excited about for for my upcoming job um is working with these companies and, and schools and organizations so that other so that when trans folks come out in their different they don't have to do the <laughs> they don't have to do as much work to educate right. their coworkers, their bosses whoever mm -hmm. um they can just live their lives but but someone also has to do the education and so i've sort of taken it upon myself because it turns out that i'm pretty good at communicating that sort of thing and i feel yeah. comfortable in the public sphere talking about my experiences and, and putting my story out there so that other people like when i first came out other people can find my story and be like hey that's my story too and then just live their life from there I, you know, I have an assumption that being an athlete your whole life uh, has really been, must have been, or again, I'm assuming it's been really beneficial in your relationship your, with your body, your relationship with yourself as an embodied being, right? Regardless of not being in the right body at first, like at least you had this really positive experience of your strength, of your speed, of your capacity, of your competence, right? And that, that uh, you know, like the fact that that was a community for your transition and that um, you could, you know, kind of this thread that goes through your life and your transition, but also that this qualities transition so well into your experience now as a woman, that it's still this big part of your life. Was that 
is that an assumption that you think is kind of true or i i think it definitely has some merit to it for sure um i i think that as yeah an athlete i've always been sort of like feeling good about how i how my body operates because i have been a good athlete not just um not just another athlete but like a varsity runner in high school for two three years um as someone who has played ultimate frisbee at a pretty high level as someone who has played disc golf at a reasonably high level uh, <laughs> although that one's a bit bit newer for me in terms of the competitive scene um and so yeah i th feel like i do feel a lot of good feelings around that um it was it was something when I first started transitioning that I was maybe worried about like the muscularity that I associated potentially with being an athlete, and also like I've kind of just embraced it because like cis women are strong too, and cis women are also athletes, and that's just sort of how it goes. Um, and so it's been a you know there there wasn't to say there wasn't challenges there, um, and also it's something where. Yeah, it's been a, a generally positive aspect for me um, in terms of that part of my thinking about my body. Um, there have been other elements of dysphoria, of course, um, but they're less connected to my experience as an athlete specifically. Can you can you expand on that a bit? If you, yeah, um, I think if you for wish. Yeah, I think for me, my dysphoria has come up in different ways. Like um, I had not a super prominent Adam's apple, but a kind of prominent Adam's apple that I noticed in pictures um, in particular. And so I got a procedure to take get that taken care of. I used to be able to grow like a big bushy beard. Um, and I got that taken care of um, with laser uh, appointments. Um, and, and that sort of thing. Um, but those aren't connected with my ability as an athlete. And again, right. like the muscularity a little bit when I first started transitioning, sort of bouncing like, because as a trans woman specifically, there are narratives as a trans woman in sport that trans women have some inherent competitive advantage over cisgender women in sport. Right. And so when I start transitioning, you hear those messages, whether you right. acknowledge them or, or, or think they're true or not, you hear those messages. And for me, playing ultimate frisbee especially on a college team where i walked into the women's college team and was immediately one of the best players mm -hmm. um because not even because i was trans because i had played for much longer than anyone else had on right. the team right, um, right and those thoughts still play in the back of my head of like okay how much of this is because i am trans right. um since i've played ultimate frisbee in a broader community and i've played against some of the best women in the world i'm like there is nothing about me being trans that makes me good at ultimate. Uh, there are these cis women who are kicking my butt out there. Um, and that's, that's fine. And that's great. That's right. sport. <laughs> there are very good people who exist in the world who you have to compete against. Um, right. One of the yeah. def differential in, in capacity in sport is often because women were not given the same opportunity to participate, not only in the sport, but in high level you know, competi mm -hmm. compet competition. So if they were allowed to play with the boys and develop those level of skills and compete with people that were better than them, then they would also develop. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So arguably skill. my advantage as a trans woman is because I was socialized into sport more. And also right. cis women who are socialized more into sport have those same advantages. Right. And so right. then that's where the physical advantages sort of don't really matter as much. Right. Well, depending on the sport, right? I mean, there that are definitely also sports true. where right. a male, male puberty, not necessarily, I mean, I don't believe hormonal levels, you know, testosterone hormone levels necessarily is the thing in the moment that counts, but um, uh, male, a first puberty that is a male puberty would affect, you know, some of the, you know, like if you're a boxer, uh, right. the size of your hand, the size of your jaw, you know, the upper body strength that can, that can, right? Not always, but that right. can develop through male puberty might affect your, but I'm still, I'm still thinking yeah. about these things, right? Well, I don't and, have it's, a, um, and it's things like, it, it really does depend on the sport, like right. straight up running. There are marginal differences, generally speaking, between men and women. Right. And also, I think a lot of people think about like, oh, you know, at the world record, Usain Bolt is this much faster than, and I'm bad at 
remembering who the top women sprinters are, but you know, the top women sprinters in the world. Like, yes. And also those top women sprinters can be 99.99% of, you know, male runners. So clearly there's not that big of a difference. Right. On whole. It's just whole the way we we, we think about it. It's the way we think about it. And it's with sports like ultimate or basketball or football or lacrosse or what have you, any of those sports that require skill, you can have women that are some of the best in the world, period. Um, and that's the case in Ultimate. There are some right. women who are just really, really good. And, and right. sure, there's some right. things where they lose out on, um, like right. in Ultimate Frisbee, you throw a disc down the field and sometimes people have to jump for the disc. And taller people will generally have an advantage. But that's the same going you know, a man to a woman as a taller woman to a shorter woman. Like it, it doesn't necessarily, those types of things don't matter as much right. with gender versus other aspects and even speed. Like, yes, I am slower than some of the guys. I am also faster than some of the guys. Right. And that's just a thing. So it's not necessarily a cut and dry thing of like, because you are a man, you are inherently better athletically. There are things on the margins that help people with higher testosterone levels right. or men. Um, but it's it would, right. more marginal than people think. It would be really interesting, especially for team sport, to, to see how a mixed gender sports team would actually fare, you know, with all men. Sport, you know, like like allowing this different yeah. skill set and, you know. I mean, so I, ultimate, I, I, ultimate Frisbee has kind of done that. Um, right. In terms of, like, there is mixed gender play. Um, and the other example that I will pull from just last year um, when Ultimate was a thing that we could do um, was I went to a tournament with a team that was a mixed gender team, but that was more heavily women than it was men, which is not common in mixed play. Um, and this was sort of a fun tournament, so it wasn't super serious. But we played lines and we played games where we had seven women seven women and non-binary folks on the field and we played against a line that had four men and three women and we won some of those games because we were more skilled we were the better right. ultimate players right regardless of gender yeah. um and it was it was the first i think it was our first game in that tournament um it was what we call an ultimate universe point winner takes all mm-hmm. um we were on defense initially which is usually a disadvantage in ultimate um but we got the turnover um, because I got a block on a guy who was trying to get a disc. Um, and then we scored. And one of my teammates, after we had won the game on that point, um, who had been leading sort of this initiative for this tournament, was like, this is the point. We made our point. Like, it is possible for a group of women and non-binary folks to win and succeed against men and women teams together. Yeah. That's um, great. It's not impossible. This is not an, an impossible dream that right. people have. Um, it's not just a gender thing. It's more complicated than that. I'm guessing you're you're familiar with uh, Jennifer Doyle. She writes a lot about uh, gender and sports. I don't um, know if I am familiar with Jennifer um, Doyle. I actually she she is a professor at a, a California university, but I don't remember which one. But cool. her articles are just so challenging for me, you know, so mind opening. And she, she brings together so many things. I'm hoping to interview her and we'll, you know, cover even more of this. Um, I, to me, it's such a fascinating conversation, yeah. gender and sports. That there's so, it's so many of our, yeah, it's complicated, <laughs> but it also brings up so many of our assumption about womanhood and, and, uh, and so much uh, patriarchal, beliefs about women's position right mm-hmm. and and uh and women in sport challenge that so much forget transgender or non-binary people right. just women playing sports uh challenges uh our patri- patriarchal ideas yeah um, but yeah. tell me more so tell me more now about your your um your social community like who are you hanging out with you know what I, this is such a hard question to ask now during COVID, but like Let's let's pretend we're pre-COVID. Like yeah. like, share with me a little bit about what's what's your life like. You yeah. know. So so pre-COVID, a lot of my life was ultimate frisbee. 
um, I spent a lot of time playing Ultimate, being around Ultimate. Um, it, it's, it was basically my home in a lot of ways, um, away from home, because I knew the folks in the community, they were very welcoming. It was it's a fun sport to play and be involved in. Um, and it was something where I could be involved in a lot of different ways. I mean, Ultimate was really the springboard for my activism. It was all based on, I wrote an article in March of 2017 being like, hey, I'm Jenna, I'm a trans woman. Here's a little bit of my story and my thoughts on the policies um, that are currently in place for trans folks in Ultimate. And that got a really big reaction um, positive reaction. And then it was sort of like, okay, this is clearly an important thing to talk about. And I went from there. And so I have been really, really involved in the ultimate community for a long time. And I continue to be, um, currently a new member on a board of directors for a women's semi-pro league in, in the Western U S. Um, so we're talking, um, about sort of like, okay, what does 2021 look like? Um, with COVID, without COVID, what does it look like for us to exist as a women's league in this world right now? Um, and, and so I've been really involved. And so, yeah. What was <laughs> the back- policy? Would, would you remind me? Because I, I either read about it or uh, on your yeah. TEDx talk, you, you give more information about it. But could you remind me what was the policy that you talked about and what was your recommendation? Yeah. So, so the initial policy uh, that USA Ultimate had Uh, back in 2016, 2017, when I started to transition, was based on uh, the NCAA policy at that time, which was um, you have to be, as a trans woman, a year on testosterone blockers in order to be eligible uh, for sanctioned competition. Um, So I was basically critiquing that because hormones aren't a great way to deal with that. And also it was like, a page long. And so they're missing a lot of details about like, okay, what happens in this situation? What happens in that situation? Mm -hmm. Um, Those types of things. And then partly my pressure, partly USA Ultimate working on this subject, they published a new policy in November, 2018, that was basically like the same hormone requirements, but more information, definitions, that sort of thing, have a more comprehensive policy. Um, and USA Ultimate is currently working on creating a new policy that has no requirements for hormones. You play as you identify at any level, which I think yeah. is fantastic. Great. That is exactly yeah. where we need that's to be. What you, that's what you want. You want just uh, I think sports, play where, where yeah. you right. I think sports at, at a fundamental level are about getting people out, getting people active, involved in their communities, um, and, and making those relationships and having those experiences. Um, And unless you're at the highest, highest level where you're like really competing for real money, for real, you know, world, world championships, it doesn't really matter how people identify. And and especially so in a team sport, especially so in a team sport where there are seven people on each team on the field at any time for ultimate, having one person who's trans isn't going to make or break that team. Do you, do you wish then that, I mean, is there still room then within, within that vision for gendered uh, teams, but where yeah. trans and non-binary can choose where they go? Or yep, you think that's exactly it what just, it is. That's what you prefer. You don't think it should just be co-ed, every, well, all the team co-ed. That's not a I, better... I think there's real benefit, um, socially at least, to have spaces where women or as otherwise put it, non-cisgender men in particular can have spaces um, to be in a community with each other. Right. So um, this is more about having a group of if, using sports and teams as your affinity group. Yeah. So it's not that you, for the sports itself, it's not, I mean, for the sports itself, you'd be like co-ed, just yeah. let it, let it be co-ed. But for, for the, the opportunity to find a group of people that you share something that that's, that's, um, you know, I, I, not only an affinity, but that is uh, allowing you to just be yourself and express, yeah. you know, social groups, that you might not, group, right. safe, safe space, safe space, right. really That's like, tr- like right. true, truly safe space where people can feel like themselves because in a co-ed setting, there can be uncomfortable situations, especially again, I'm just going to keep pointing the fig- finger at cisgender men, but like in co-ed situations, it's not always comfortable for, right non-cisgender men to be in those spaces um 
And so having spaces for those folks, um, I think is really valuable. I mean, obviously women's sports have existed as a thing because in part, there are assumptions that we have about athleticism that we categorize by gender. And also there, there's real benefit to have girls right. growing up or women being able to play together and be in community with each other. It's funny, and it's also like we, sh we shouldn't mm -hmm. exclude trans and non-binary people from having those experiences. Right. And we right. shouldn't say you have to be in this one category. If a non-binary person or a trans person wants to play on a women's team because they feel like they're more welcome in that community, like they should absolutely be able to do that. Right. Regardless of how they identify. Absolutely. Yeah. And so it's, that that's right. the important thing for me. Yeah. No, I I hear you. And it's funny because I think it 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 um it talks about a it talks of a, of a kind of conflicted uh, uh, interest. One is to uh break these assumptions about uh women in sport, which would lead us to say, no, you know, like allow girls to compete with boys together, let's break the, the gendered assumption. And this is a very forward thinking, thinking about, uh, um, you know, long-term benefit to having girls able to, to compete with boys, to be looked at equally, to break the assumptions. But it doesn't uh, speak with the need right now in a still very patriarchal, still very violent um, uh, environment for women and trans women or non, you know, nonsense men uh, uh, culture that there needs to be environments that are safe and yeah. and 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 also just um, not just safe but just really uh, helping in in yeah. in blossoming of of girls yeah. and non cause sports cis have men. A, so yeah, because sports have a lot of power to build, especially with young kids, like to build confidence and leadership and teamwork and all of those right. aspects that you see plastered up on mm -hmm. on motivational posters. Um, right. So, so for me, I think sports, generally speaking, and obviously this is sort of not thinking about the highest, highest competitive levels, but I think mm -hmm. sports should just be inclusive in general, should have a model of inclusivity. If you, ident however you identify, you should be welcome to play our sport. We yep. should create those spaces and the ability for those people to play um, the sport as, as they want. Right. Um, and also sometimes the way that people want to play their sport is with other people who look and have their same experiences. Right. And so then you're going to end up having some splitting based on experiences, likely gender, because that's how we have our society built in large, mm -hmm. large areas. Um, so you're go still going to have some of that splitting, but that doesn't mean you're excluding people from those teams necessarily. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, th I think it's more of a inclusivity model for sport is to yeah. welcome everyone, be inclusive as possible, um, and then go from there in terms of figuring out, okay, what does that look like in terms of how our teams are set up yeah. um, in general? Yeah. So I was, I was going back to, to, to your personal life versus <laughs> sports specifically, which is your personal life too. It's one of your, clearly one of your passions. Um, I, I was wondering, so when you, uh, are you straight first? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I am definitely queer. I'm currently dating a woman, um, okay. which has been good. I'm, sexuality was a thing that I was figuring out when I first started transitioning. Um, I was single at the time when I started transitioning, and my thought was, I'm going to figure out my own personal identity, and then I'll figure out the whole dating thing. Um, and then what, it was... What, what, what about as a teenager? Do you, did you have a sense so, of your sexual orientation? Or yeah, not so, so I, I dated girls growing up. Um, and I think part of that is just my own personal sexual orientation is right. towards women has mm -hmm. been continues to be, will be. Yeah. Um, and also I think I wonder, I sometimes wonder if part of that was I was playing a role because I was very much from the ages of 12 to 22, absolutely specific role as I'm appearing as a cisgender straight white guy. And that's yeah. just what I am. I am, I'm showing that to the world. And in order to seem as normal as possible, I would, right. of course, then date women because that's a thing that cis guys do or, right. sorry, straight guys do. Mm -hmm. um, so because of that, I think I think it's probably both factors um, because some people with sexual orientation does seem to change when they transition. Um, and but mine didn't. 
So it's interesting. Yeah. I didn't know that sexual orientation changed. During I, I, so I, I don't even know if it's necessarily change, but it's more that sometimes some trans folks um, find that when they are able to really feel like themselves in their identity, that the way that they interact with other people and the world changes right. because of course that it does. Sense. And right. sometimes that leads to also a change in sexual orientation, right? Like maybe because a trans woman um, wanted to be perceived as, you know, straight, they dated women, uh, but that was only the thing that they did to, to give that perception to the world. And that wasn't actually their actual feelings. So then when they transition to be a trans woman, they're like, oh, actually my right. affinity towards women before was not real. And actually yeah. I'm more interested in men. Men, right, um, right. So it's not necessarily that that it changes so much as right. there's an appearance of change depending on right. how people acted before. For me, it didn't change right. in my interactions stayed the same orientation towards women the whole time. Yeah, I think it's 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 interesting because it breaks one um I think really toxic um line of I don't know if you call them arguments, but I've you know read and heard people question transitioning at a later age as being um deeply homophobic. So like if you always like boys mm -hmm. um and as a, maybe as a teen, you thought, oh, I must be gay. And then as a young man, as a younger, as an older person, you were like, no, I'm really trans. And I feel mm -hmm. like we, I hear it most more about women because uh, trans men, because, you know, clearly, uh, living as a woman is, is, you know, living under patriarchy with all of the mm -hmm. sexism that you experience. So that if you are a gay, quote unquote, masculine, uh, girl uh, and you deal with all of the negativity around your identity uh, then transitioning into being a man with it would be kind of coming up in the world right and so yeah. i hear a lot of kind of uh, uh arguments about that so i feel i feel like in some ways the fact that you were not at any point identifying as a gay person uh, yeah. but you were always straight kind of at least in your case completely just just that argument cannot apply to you and you yeah, know and, I, and it does really just depend on the person and the situation i think there is an assumption with trans men that um i think to use the turf uh language of it they're you know failed lesbians or something right. um when that's not remotely true they are transgender men right. some of whom happen to continue to be interested in women and there are some trans men who are gay, right? And that is a thing. Um, and yeah, so I think I think sexual orientation and gender often get conflated, yes. and they're Very they're definitely so. related, but they're not the same. And trans folks are as likely to be straight or gay or bi or what have you as cis people are. Mm -hmm. Like if the percentage of the population you would expect to maybe be yeah. similar, although maybe trans people are going to be more queer. But just because we've probably thought about our identities and sexualities more than right. cis people have. Yeah. So we're probably going to be more queer because we're more in tune and aware of sort of where our feelings are. Like right. sometimes when people ask me how I, what my sexual orientation is, I, I'll sometimes say that I'm queer because I've never dated a guy. Mm -hmm. I've never had that interaction. Would I be strictly opposed to dating a guy? I don't think so but I'm happily dating a woman right now and I don't think that's going to change. And so in that way, then I am gay and a lesbian. And also like I could be queer in some way because I've never dated the guy, but I'm not opposed to it strictly. Mm -hmm. So that makes sense. It's more complicated than that. And, and if more cis folks were sort of in tune with those possibilities, then I think there would be more queerness in the world yeah. um, than there currently is. You know, I was just thinking how, you know, there is more and more representation of women, uh, cis women looking really, um, uh, choosing to uh, express themselves in, in, you know, such a wide range, you know, like very athletic, very uh, muscular, um, very androgynous, uh, um, uh, you know, just, just such a range. But then when you look at the media about stories around trans women and trans girls, they usually really hyper 
quote unquote feminine, right? Like uh, mm-hmm. little girls that like pink and, and, and do ballet and women who are just, you know, so gorgeously feminine, you know? And I, I, I think that's really hurtful to a, a younger trans person coming mm-hmm. up that might be much more interested in, in you know, in sports and, yeah. and wanting to be and not caring about closing and, you know, uh, makeup. Like, it, yeah. I think it's wonderful I mean, to start yeah. seeing, I, you know, what a range the, of the, representation. Yeah. And the media wants to share certain stories because they fit into the classic narratives that we have. Of gender. And the classic narrative yeah. is that, of gender, exactly. That in the classic narrative is that women are going to be more feminine. Therefore, trans women and trans girls are going to want to be more feminine. Right. Which is true. And also, that doesn't mean that's true across the board. No, it's um, not. Like right. in my experience, it's it's sort of things of like, you know, I will paint my nails. Oh, there, they're chipped at the moment. Um, like paint my nails. I have longer hair. Um, I will wear some brighter colors. Although my girlfriend also complains that I wear mostly grays and blacks, right. um, which is true. <laughs> but like that doesn't make me less of so a. So do I. Just, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Like so many people do, and like I also at the same time enjoy like. I, when it finally gets cold in California, which it has not yet, like I enjoy wearing like different types of sweaters and I enjoy wearing scarves and those types of things that I didn't get to do in quite the same way as a guy. And right. those, there, there are various things that like, like being in women's yeah, spaces feels guys much more like that stuff for me. too. I mean, yeah. there's a whole fashion industry and for and men. So, right. And so, it's like clothing is part of a gender expression, but that doesn't right. mean one thing or mm-hmm. another. And and same with trans girls, like, um, or trans kids in general, like there is very much a, you should go this way. And even as a trans person, when I first started transitioning, I'm like, will my style change? And so sometimes I got things that I bought and wore a few times. And it was like, that's not my style. <laughs> I'm very much more like athletic woman going to wear like right. crew cut, sweat sweaters and like t-shirts and jerseys yeah 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 because that's who i am right and and that's that's great yeah that's what it is um yeah so it's definitely not yeah yeah well i'm very thankful for you choosing to put yourself out there because i think you are uh, quite the role model uh and again like just an opportunity for a diversity of of ways to be in the world as a as a woman and um, and I, I from the outside, you definitely look like you have an incredibly vibrant life. You're about to start an exciting job where you're really getting to contribute uh, to your community. Yeah. You you play really high level sports, which I'm really <laughs> jealous about, even if it's not right now. And and you have a girlfriend. It sounds like you have a a, a good group of friends. I'm wondering what's you know if you have a vision for the next five years or if you have something specifically that you're working on that feels like something that, that, you know, is missing or that you feel like, okay, that's my next level challenge. This is what I want to work on either as a, you know, in your transition or like you feel like you're completely, that's, that's the past or yeah. in other level, other, other ways in your life. Um, yeah. I think at the moment, I'm feeling actually pretty good about where I'm at. I'm very excited about this new job. I think it'll set me up well. I don't know how long I'll be there, but hopefully at least three to five years um, right. and then find find what else is next. Um, yeah, and yeah, hopefully stay with my girlfriend because that's been good so far, although it's been tough through the pandemic, of right. course. Um, so yeah, I, I think I'm just sort of looking forward to getting to finally settle in my life a little bit more. I have moved a lot. I've been switching sort of my career path and my degree program and all of that in the last five years or so as I transitioned. And to finally be like, I have a job. I'm in a, re- I'm in a great relationship. Like hopefully I can, um, I'm currently living with my parents. Hopefully I can move out and get my own place in a little bit. Um, and just sort of like be more settled and actually like get away from the school aspect and the uncertainty that I've been for the next few years. In terms of my transition, I've been feeling pretty good about things. There are definitely a couple of boxes that I'd like to check off still, some procedures that I'd like to get done. Um, but, you know, it depends on how things go going forward. Um, we'll sort of see how where life takes me. 
in the future. But as a whole, I'm sort of feeling pretty settled with where I am. I've been doing a lot of good work in the community in different ways, both the ultimate community, the trans community, et cetera. Um, and I don't think that's going to stop. So yeah, I'm I'm kind of in this good place. Strange place. <laughs> I mean, it sounds place. great. It sounds really I, it's a, it's wonderful. It's a good place. It, it feels strange to me because I've been in so much uncertainty, especially with the pandemic and job hunting and finishing school in the last year. And now I'm sort of like, wait, I actually am pretty settled and have these things now sort of like good for me, which is exciting and also kind of strange for me. So I mean, honestly, I'm hopeful that'll just continue. Yeah, <laughs> I hope so for you too. I'm, you know, I'm a mom and I have to say like, if my kids... Uh, are where you are at 27, feeling so good about their life, a good job, a girlfriend, you know, feeling like, you know, life is, is a, life is good. I'd be very proud because the 20s are not easy regardless, you know? <laughs> so I think you're in yeah. a really good place. And, uh, yeah. um, and I'm, and I'm pleased with where I've come. It's, it's kind of wild to think that all of like four years ago, right. four and a bit years ago, I was just starting to transition. Um, That's a, Big Which deal, is, yeah. That's it's, it's amazing how kind much. Of ama it's amazing how much has changed and how much has happened in my so life. Like thinking time. about yeah. all the things that I've talked about with you and I've written about and spoken about, that's only been in like three and a half, four years. Crazy. Um, which is incredible that that so much has happened. I've done so many different things. Jenna, um, life is going to be so boring now. So <laughs> boring. You're never going to have such an explosion. Uh, I mean, besides from zero to four, right? You're never going to change and develop so dramatically in your life. That's it. You know, and maybe that's not a bad thing. <laughs> no, I know. Um, I'm joking. So, so, you know, I feel like being a little bit more settled in, in where I'm at is going to maybe hopefully feel a little bit more more welcome to me. I have been sort of saying for a while, I'm actually kind of looking forward to having more of a kind of nine to five-esque job. Mm -hmm. I, I, my job is luckily not exactly nine to five because I'll be right. doing other things and I'll be a little bit more flexible. But just to have the structure yeah. of that after being in school and working part-time and in the middle of the pandemic, that the idea of just being able to, I am working and then I have my girlfriend and we're living life. Yeah. It just feels very like, okay, this is normal. I can actually be yeah. without having to think about necessarily everything that's coming next. Yeah. So what happens in the next five years? I hope this continues. I hope I continue to grow and develop and continue to do this kind of work in the community and, and we'll go from there. So In the long yeah. term, do you think you want children? <laughs> I know, very long term question because you're so young. But I, well, do you and, see yourself as a mom, or not? Not really thought about that yet. Ch children's a hard thing when you're a trans person. Um, it's complicated in terms of whether that's in terms of biological children, at least. Well, that, yeah. I think it's no, a very I, complicated question in terms right. of children in Just, general. Right. I don't know. Um, I think my girlfriend and I currently are like, we just want to get to a place where we can live together and then maybe yeah. have a pet and then we'll yeah. go from there. <laughs> You're so my, young. That was just a very long shot question. I don't, I don't my think my inclination you should know that is, right. yeah, my inclination is probably not, but I would be very happy to be a uh, aunt to any of my uh, friends, kids or, or such. Um, yeah. Cause I have some of my best friends are in, great straight relationships um and i would not be surprised if they eventually have kids yeah and i would be sure, yeah. happy to be to be aunt have have my friends go away for a weekend and i can watch their kids for a bit fine <laughs> with me good. and then give them right back to them later <laughs> that sounds good how important is passing in mm -hmm. your community of people that choose to transition later in life right that mm -hmm. didn't have that choice necessarily as young people two how much of the medical transition are people choosing to have, right? Mm -hmm. And with as much detail as makes sense to have, right? Yeah. Like, um, especially for someone like you who is is gay, who's queer, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and you know, therefore does not have to necessarily appeal to straight men. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thankfully, I have um, not much interest in appealing to straight men. Yeah, very much. which is I, what I of do freedom. say I'm queer, but like, yeah, yeah. No. <laughs> I think passing is important for trans folks because for trans women in particular um, who transition later in life or post post first puberty um, because it's a measure of safety for one um, for 
passing allows you to exist in the world without being worried that you're going to be outed as a trans woman. Um, and I will say as a white trans woman, I have a lot of privilege here um, versus trans women of color, especially black trans women. Um, average life expectancy, the number thrown around is 35 years mm. for, for black trans women and trans women of color. Um, and that's a real thing where right. people are killed for being trans, um, right. especially trans women. And so passing is arguably a measure of, of some safety. Um, and I think it's also that society says that women have to look a certain way. And if you've been raised with the messages of women have to look a certain way, then you want to look exactly. a certain way. Um, and, and some of that is societal, in which case then maybe you can argue against it or not. And some of it is just like a, as a woman, I feel like I need to be in the world a certain way. Um, mm -hmm. But I would say definitely, it's also like just an ease of, of living in the world. Like if you can pass, then you can just go about your life without thinking about your gender presentation right. all the time. Certainly right. I found that like once I realized that I was mostly passing, um, I just, I, you know, run errands and I can go around the world and people generally gender me as a woman. And it's just I can live life without worrying that I'll be outed right. or that I'll get misgendered or such. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's a real benefit um, yeah. to to not have to think about it all the time, to not have it be so present um, is really, really useful. And again, it's partially that like, it's it's also partially that having gone through male puberty initially, it's like there are certain secondary sexual characteristics that you want to change to be able to, again, to pass. And so then that influences other decisions as well. Um, so yeah, I, I, it is important. It's obviously not everything though. And I've certainly found that I am not as concerned whether I pass or not. And also that's a privilege of I do pass largely mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. i can be like passing is not a big deal but that's also because i pass i'm like it's not a big deal do you have uh friends and colleagues and connections who have transitioned later do not pass or chose not to pass chose not to uh have so many of the medical transitions either they did and they still don't pass or they just didn't want to do them they were, um, they just i think generally the trans women i know tend to pass or try to pass but it also depends on like how active and present you are in the community um right. like i know some folks who are out as trans very publicly um you know don't worry as much about passing even if they have mm -hmm. gone through medical transition in some form or another, right? Because they already they're already public as trans. Like right. same with me, right? That's right. another reason right. why I'm not as concerned about passing is because I am liable to tell you I'm trans anyway within 15 minutes of meeting right. you. Like, right. <laughs> so so for me it's not as much of an issue. But if you're just trying to live your life, if you're not publicly out as trans and you don't right. want to be, then passing is everything. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it really also depends on on the situation, medical transition or not. Um, right. So yeah, I, I think it does also depend on how public people are. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think that's that's my answer on that. And the, the hormones, um, you know, are they? Uh, how do they? Besides the the positive impact of the hormones, mm -hmm. do they? do they make you feel sick? Do they, you know, do they have impact on, on your moods? You know, like you feel nothing, you feel totally fine. I mean, I've also been on them for four years. So yeah. I, I don't body really is remember. Adapted. Yeah. yeah. It's just sort of what, what they're used to. I mean, I have mm -hmm. the cover my medical information here, you know, pill bottle one, mm -hmm. pill bottle two mm -hmm. um, for my hormones every day. Um, but yeah, I, and I, I certainly now, um, four years into my transition it's like life is life and I just sort of do it and don't think about it that much I just take some medication in the morning and in, in the evening like a lot of people do um, for one thing or another um, yeah. so yeah and not that. really mm -hmm. yeah and that's and that's that I I feel more like emotion than I did before transition which 
arguably is probably partially hormones and also partially I feel like I can express my emotions more as a woman instead of right. showing this face as a man where men are generally told that they're not supposed right. to have and show emotion. Right. Um, well, also like when you have to like keep a very key part of yourself down, mm-hmm. yeah, if you're <laughs> then you're going to repress other of, things. Right. things. Exactly. A lot of other um, things are going to be under lockdown too. Right. So, yeah. so yeah, I, I would say that. Yeah. And it's, once my body got adapted to what hormones I was on, it's just sort of been those. So your hormones that your body works on, if I were to go off of my hormones for a long period of time, it would probably really suck because my body yeah. would be like, why are you well, not giving me the right. right hormones anymore? Right. Um, so yeah, I think for me, hormones have been fine. Um, I also take them in pill form, which means that I'm on a more steady dose per day. Some people who do injections um, sometimes say that they get a little bit more moody, like right before their next injection. Right, because they're like, because they're bit at the end of it, yeah. bit at the end of it. But like, same with people who have menstrual cycles. Right. Like when your hormones change, your emotions oh, sometimes change. Like <laughs> the sort of life, right? And yeah. and so it's not. Yeah. yeah, it's it's really just that your body runs on a sex hormone. And it just depends on which one. And then your body mm-hmm. is sort of like, cool. This is where we're Is there we're anything at, right? that you miss about testosterone? Um, I, at least initially, when I, and again, this is my perspective as an athlete, like I got slightly slower and I had slightly less endurance and could mm. jump slightly less high. Those types of things. I, I could lift less weight. Um, not that I was ever really a weightlifter um, right. as a runner, mostly. Um, but yeah, I mean a little bit. And also I went from being one of the faster guys to one of the faster women. Um, and I'm still fast compared to some men. So it's not been an issue for me. Anything else besides athletic capacity? Was there anything else in your temperament or no, not really. I mean, what about your libido? (laughs) Libido hasn't, I don't know, hasn't changed that much maybe slightly lower but also it depends on the situation because as i said i was single when i started transitioning and i have been single i was single until right before the pandemic and then i've had a girlfriend for the pandemic mostly but we've also been apart from each other so i hard to say i think i think those types of things are very individual Mm -hmm. individualized it it very much depends on the person and their experiences and how they are as a person and and again that's just like cis people like some cis people have higher libidos and some have lower libidos and that's just sort of how it goes and of course yeah it's the same thing for trans folks and i didn't notice that much of a change again maybe a little bit lower but not significantly so i don't think um and it's and if it's lower, I don't necessarily miss it. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I think no is the answer. Because because for me, like transitioning and getting on the right hormones was just sort of like it felt right. Right. Things I felt, felt right. good. Right. And so any negative changes, negative, right. quote unquote, negative changes, right. like are offset by the positive feelings of like, being myself and being able to have my own experiences in these ways. Um, right. So it's certainly not, not negative in, in any of yeah. those ways. Again, besides maybe at least initially a little bit of like, uh, I'm not quite as fast as I was. I'm not quite as strong as I was. And also like, I'm a woman and I am strong and fast for a woman. And like, that feels good to me because yeah. I am a woman and that is where I'm at. Yeah. And I, I don't, think certainly very much anymore about like oh i lost this thing it's like no you're just that's who you are and this is how right. you are in the world yeah <laughs> thank you um, yeah the other questions that you had i think it's again going to be depend on the person i will say i am not a medical expert uh, certainly in general let alone on youth transitions and and puberty blockers and that whole thing um i think it'll probably just be a different relationship to to their bodies for trans kids than than i had 
um, which I would say probably arguably is good because there's probably more of a feeling of like figuring out what parts of your body feel good and which parts don't. Um, in terms of genitals, I know that a lot of trans women I know tend to go for bottom surgery, uh, which I think is sort of a thing that people feel like would quote unquote complete their transition or um, it's just something that they feel like they really want to or need to do um, for dysphoria reasons. Um, right. And I also know trans women who have not had that same bottom surgery um, mm -hmm. and are fine with their genitals as they are. Um, personally, I'm still trying to decide where I lean. I think mm -hmm. I'm currently leaning more towards eventually having bottom surgery, which is to say that I have not yet had bottom surgery. Mm -hmm. um, but I also am like, oh, I don't know. I feel pretty good about where my body is at and also right. would be improved with bottom surgery. I think arguably so in terms of my experience, especially since like it, and this is, this feels like it shouldn't matter, but like being able to wear an actual swim, like a bikini or being able to wear certain dresses or skirts without worrying about what right. might accidentally show, right. um, to be able to wear spandex mm -hmm. and not be, you know, concerned about any of that. Like it, if I get bottom surgery, I know that there will be many hours and many, you know, a lot of brain space around those instances that will stop being right. a worry for me. Right. It feels good for me to not have to think and worry about that all the time. Right. So, it's it, but so, it, it's also a big right. process. It's a big, expensive, yeah. hard surgery, yeah. and not everyone, a, not everyone has the capacity to do it, let alone right. wants to do it because it's expensive. If you don't have insurance in the U.S. that covers it, it's like thousands right. and thousands, tens of thousands right. of dollars. Right. So, right. yeah. It, it kind of just depends on the situation for the person right. whether and it's, it's even a big possible. surgery. It is, right. and, and that's why surgery. I haven't done it yet because, right. at least partially, it's a big deal. It's, it's a not big a deal. small thing. Right. Yeah, it, it takes is a, big a long deal. time to recover, and so for me, if I'm gonna get it done at some point, I'm gonna like if I'm still playing ultimate at that point, I'm gonna try to plan it so that it's at the end of my ultimate season, so I can get back to playing right. ultimate in time because right. I know I'm gonna be off my feet for like right. three to six months. I, so this might not be a fair <laughs> comparison, and you know, please feel free to check me if I'm if I'm saying things that are offensive. But as a woman, you know, who's uh, a cis woman mm -hmm. who's um, been shamed and judged uh, about my appearance my whole life, mm -hmm. right? And uh, who has a relationship with her body that has been uh, very much influenced with, you know, uh, being attractive, attractive mm -hmm. to men. Um, in my case, uh, there is that headspace, you know, is, you know, that concern, you know, like, mm -hmm. uh, you know, is, uh, I can't, I do not wear a bikini, never have worn right. bikini. You know, it wasn't because of a penis. It was because of fat. Right. right? Like, but same, same concern that was about how I'm perceived. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, not same, right? Like yeah. there is a different impact clearly. Um, but part of it for me, it feels like the dysphoria, the hatred of your body is, you know, of a part of your body, you know, I've felt it, not for, again, not dysphoria, but just a, a dislike of my body. I felt it. A lot of women yeah. feel it. A lot of women do plastic mm -hmm. surgery because of it, right? Yeah. Change their breast size, uh, uh, change their nose, uh, mm -hmm. now even change their genitalia, right? Mm -hmm. So much of it is is connected to uh, being attractive, being acceptable. And I can see how if you're trans with all the, uh, if you're a trans woman and you're straight with all the homophobia, uh, being able to find, uh, to, to, uh, meet someone, a straight man might really be connected to doing bottom surgery. Mm -hmm. Right. Could be. But to a certain extent, it's like, could be right. But it doesn't have to be, but right. You, right. Like it's one of those things, the same question that women, cis women, trans women ask themselves, how, how can, I attract someone and mm -hmm. how do I make myself uh, acceptable physically, right? It's a very centrally feminine question, right? Like uh, about changing our body and, and being acceptable in the world. Um, and so 
I'm not fully sure where I'm going with this, but I feel like there is one aspect that's like, clearly you don't either. Uh, there's one aspect of that that feels to me like very uh, specific to to a trans experience, which I can't really, well, which I can relate to to a certain extent, but it's just like a, a deep, deep discomfort with a part of your body mm -hmm. that really leads to saying, I need to change that in order to feel whole. Mm -hmm. And some women feel that about other things about their body mm -hmm. that have created a lot of uh, uh, dis dis just feelings of um of a uh, pain uh, yeah. throughout their life but it's very it's much more specific right to a trans experience yeah. um and then there is the other aspect which feels like much closer to plastic surgery right the stuff mm -hmm. that we that so much of our culture kind of pushes us to do as women to make ourselves more uh, attractive and then it feels like the trade-offs are you know the uh the medical consequences of a surgery, right? The right. intensity of it versus the benefit of like change your body. Anyway, yeah, that's where I'm going. I, uh, I think there are definitely similarities. Um, and I also think that depending on the situation of the surgery, right? Like I say that I would like to wear a bikini. I don't, I also don't know if I would ever wear a bikini regardless of what surgery I would have right. or not have. Because um, right. I just generally may not be comfortable with that. I'm probably much more comfortable wearing like a sports bra and spandex um, right. as I have been. Um, so I think there's definitely aspects of that. I will say personally, I have not had as much bottom dysphoria as I know other trans folks do who feel that it is a absolutely necessary part. It right. is like causing them serious mental anguish. Right, right. For me, no, I understand I'm, that. I'm right. more, more ambivalent towards it. Um, and also I think if given the opportunity where I could get that done and recover and have it mostly, if not all covered by insurance, then like I would probably take that opportunity. Although again, yeah. I'm still undecided. There's a reason why right. I still have not done it. And I know right, other right. folks who are my age or younger who have gone bomb surgery. And right. so I feel like it is a very personal thing. I think in terms of relationships, mm -hmm. um, one thing that I definitely thought about in terms of surgery, but also in terms of life is like, how will my partner you know, view me and see me and, and feel about me? Um, and I think it's really important for anyone, obviously, but especially for trans folks to find people who accept you as you are and love you for who you are, regardless of the situation, um, right. whether surgery or, or what have you. Um, and I've been mm -hmm. very lucky to not only have friends um, in general who I like said, hey, I'm trans, this is a thing. And they're like, cool, I'm excited for you. Yeah, And like, I have one friend in particular who um, I've known since college. He and I play disc golf a lot together. Um, and we basically interact essentially the same as we did then as we do now, except that it's like wonderful. when we were out playing disc golf the other day, he made a comment about like, you know, I'm surprised that more people don't think that we're dating. Um, yeah. And I was like, I agree. I am surprised that they don't see you know, man and a woman who are clearly friends and of the same age, they wouldn't just assume that we're dating and no right. one has asked that. And I was like, I agree. I feel like people would ask that even though you are straight and in a great relationship and I am gay and in a great relationship. Um, yeah. But like the two of us are get along fine because I am very right. lucky to have him as a very good friend who has yeah, that's great. You're been very, very accepting of yeah. me before and now. And, and same with a you know, a romantic or sexual relationship, like yeah. finding people who are, you know, who want to be with you regardless of, of the situation. Um, and it's hard for all of us, it's, but it's hard especially for all of us. Hard. Can, it's especially hard for trans folks. <laughs> right. Exactly. Um, yeah. <laughs> and so, you know, I, good friends are hard to find. Good, good exactly. partners are hard to find. Yeah, and you and, just add one layer of. Yeah. Right. And I feel like in my current relationship that I'm in a really good place and we've been on, we've been the two of us, me and my girlfriend have been communicating really well um, around all the different issues. And also, we haven't seen each other in person very often because there's a pandemic. Right. So, right, right. <laughs> you know, there's still obviously going to be right, things to navigate. Lot to discover, exactly, right. Exactly, because you're in a relationship. Right. And that's what happens in any relationship. Right. It just is a one more added level of complexity. Right. But that, that, now that you put it that way, I, I, I can see how your woman 
and when you are the most intimate with your lover, you want them to fully see you as a woman. In our culture, womanhood is associated with a vulva. And so there would be that moment of being like, is she going to feel, or is he, depending on who you're dating, going to see me differently and see me less of a woman because of this. I can see how incredibly painful that would be yeah. and, and threatening and if you can right and if you can find a relationship where, where person, that's not an issue where it's not right. an issue then it's entirely a personal choice right then it right. then it's right. i think very freeing in that way because then if i have a partner who's like yeah i don't really care what genitals you have i'm going to love you anyway and we're going to have a good right. time regardless right. like and i see you as a woman and, i don't and I have see you as any a woman, doubt that's, about that that's yeah. not an issue then like right. for for whoever is in that situation then it's much more of like, okay, do I want this for myself? Which I feel like is a much healthier decision and a, a much healthier place to be in terms of making that decision to potentially have a surgery for your own self and not be thinking about what it means for either a current partner or a future potential partner. Yeah. I mean, those are great answers. And, you know, yeah. I think that um, you do, you know, I think you, you know, I want to say you're lucky, you know, I, I think in the sense that you, yeah. you, you have a set of circumstances that are considering your life struggle, you know, what you had to, to figure out in order to be who you are. They're really good. You know, like you got a, a supportive uh, friend, supportive uh, sports community. You have, um, you're white, like you pointed out. Yeah. You're sheltered from a lot of violence. Um, I, I, you know, you you're in a good place emotionally, mentally. I mean, clearly, you've had a, a good roots that make you uh, a somebody who's centered and have a love for themselves. Um, you know, yeah. before and after. So I, you know, I think to have these answer, this is like kind of like the best case in some way. No, nah, you is. know, there's always, but it's it's kind of the best case scenario and, that yeah. parents and younger people coming up can look and see, huh, look yeah. at how good things can be. And, and they're real choice. Like the, you make it sound like there is a real choice between, you know, uh, the level of medical transition that you do and that making those decisions, you know, don't, do, do not have to affect, uh, how vibrant your love life is mm-hmm. and how good your, you know, how good your life is. Yeah. So that's, yeah. And I think that's so, very reassuring. Yeah. I think, a couple of things there. I agree. I am very lucky. And I, yeah, all things considered, I am a success story when it comes to trans folks. Um, and I, I've been like, I, I don't want that to make it seem like, oh, the world's a great place for trans folks because of this one clear example. And also it's helpful to see and hear that not all exactly. trans stories are tragic stories. That yes. there, there are real mm-hmm. happy stories of trans people transitioning, being successful, having successful relationships, and that just being a thing. Um, mm-hmm. And a lot of my privilege that I've had around family, social work, um, race, et cetera, like part of that has allowed me to do what I do, right? Having a supportive family, having a supportive friends and work has allowed me to be able to step out and be like, hey, this is my story. I'm going to help educate people. I'm going to be one of the people who's trying to lead the way because most other people don't have the advantages that I have. And most other people can't do what I do. Don't want to stand up on a stage in front of 2,000 people and be like, hi, right, I'm everyone. Jenna, I'm trans. <laughs> like it's not for right. everyone. And also if I can be the person with the privilege that I have, know that I can go up in, a, in front of a stage in front of 2,000 people and come out as and and tell my story as a trans person and have that not be an issue for me, then other people don't have to. Then I can be the one to educate people to lead the way that right. then other so people can knowledge. follow along yeah. and not yeah. have to feel like they have to do as much work. If I can make other people's lives e- easier, other trans folks, other non-binary folks, if I can make their lives easier by educating others, by being right. that vocal presence and voice, then I won't do that 100% of the time. That is yeah. what I am all about, making other people's lives better and easier um, so they can follow in my path and there can be more trans folks who have more success stories like mine without having to be the public presence that I've been. 
Well, thank you. I think you're really awesome. Thank you. And Appreciate that. <laughs> I, w- I wish you uh, more and more luck in your life and wonderful yeah. experiences. And I'm uh, really grateful for uh, your openness and communication. Yeah, and of course. And you're, like I said, I hope you're welcome to uh, use the latter half if you'd like um thank you yeah i'll <laughs> i'll see what how it makes sense and if it makes sense i i i want to you know i you know i'm i'm entering a new project i don't know um i feel like i'm going to need I, I mean your feedback seems to to be that it it would be helpful for younger trans people coming up so you know i I want to make sure that what I'm doing is is helpful to both parents, but also the trans community. Yeah. I don't want to, um, yeah, you know, I don't, I, I think, I'm still not yeah. fully educated. I don't want to do things that are obnoxious and I want to be respectful yeah. and whatnot. And I want to figure out how to do it in ways that, that works. But yeah, I'm thinking maybe as a separate segment with clear explanation of what, what's in that segment. Um, yeah. So that and, also parents can choose what to share with their children. Yeah. A, and I think it's, for children. I think it's helpful generally to have more information, to have more stories out there. Um, and yeah, I think it just sort of depends that like when I talk about like bottom surgery, it's like, that is a thing that people think about yeah. and, and yeah. is worth yeah. like considering, like, is this a thing that everyone does? No. Right. Is it a thing no. that right. everyone does for certain reasons? No. Right. Um, yes. right. Right. And, and also like, just to be like, look, I'm, I'm 27. I'm happy. I have a girlfriend and I don't have surgery and I'm still considering it, yeah. but I clearly don't feel like I have to get it to be a happy person. Yeah. That's, that's a, that's a good message out there too, because it should be a meaningful choice, yeah. right? Everything should be a meaningful choice. Anyways, I wanted to ask you, Jenna, if you could, um, think in your free time, uh, your tons of free time, I'm sure. Um, anybody else that you think I should connect with, you know, uh, the website will not be just public figures like you, but really what I'm hoping is that they will be, you know, construction workers and, right. you know, um, architects and scientists and anthropologists and bartenders and, you know, whatever you might have imagined yourself to be as a child, right. you know, a firefighter, yeah. um, uh, uh, Maybe not a dog walker, because I don't think anybody imagined themselves as a dog walker. <laughs> That's a job you do when you're trying to pay money while you do your artwork, yeah. right? But anyways, um, you know, people, trans women, trans men, bi- non-binary people who are uh, in all walks of lives, if you would offer them to connect me with them so I can do more interview and profile them, I think that's that's my that's my interest right now. Sure. Yeah, I can work on thinking about those folks. Thank you so much. All right, Jenna, you have a good day. I hope the the first few weeks of your new job go well. Me too. Great. All right. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you for being here and for listening. We hope you are feeling inspired to share your own experience and reality. If you like this video, please share it. You can follow us and hear about our latest video on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And please subscribe to our YouTube channel. And remember that you are valued, you are loved, we see you.